All right, welcome to the uh, MT for Christ 24-7 podcast. This is MT Clark, and tonight we're, we're doing the last lesson of the Bondage Breaker series, uh, the Bondage Breaker Discipleship class, Lesson 12. And uh, as always, I say that's based on uh, Dr. Neil Anderson's book, The Bondage Breaker, and Chapter 12. And uh, tonight's lesson is Helping Others. Um, but before we do that, I just uh, we're here at Rock Solid Church, and uh, we just worship to Matt Mayer's "Lord, I Need You," um, because boy, do we need him, and uh, and we also need to uh, go to him in prayer. So let me start with that. Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here uh, once again um, to uh, to draw close to you, draw close to your safety and your goodness, and um, to you know, to learn, uh, to learn about um, how we should walk in this world and how we can be safe um, when we stand in our identity of who we are in Christ and stand against the forces of darkness. Lord, we just thank you for uh, delivering us to the end of the series, and uh, we pray um, for the students here tonight and the students uh, listening in via podcast, either you know, soon or or in the distant future, that uh, the Holy Spirit would um, bless um, bless the the lesson and bless them, um, uh, that they would uh, that the Holy Spirit would speak to them and move their hearts to to embrace what they've learned and to practice it and to share it with other people. Uh, Lord, we just thank you um, and. Uh, we just pray for your uh, blessing and anointing on the lesson and uh, on all the students listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Um, like I said, basically we're at the end. And at the end, sometimes things grind to a halt. Um, Anderson sort of goes on a shopping spree at the end of the uh, <laughs> a marketing campaign at the end of the chapter. And, um, you know, it's uh, the older versions were a little different and... I honestly was thinking about changing things, but I decided to stay true to the current current um, current edition and uh, just sort of go off of that. So um, I might, who knows? I might review and uh, come up with something uh, to add to the mix as a standalone lesson, um, or just you know walk walk away and and thank thank Anderson for what he's done and respect his new edition. Um, and what did he teach us, you know, and through all of, of the 11 lessons so far? You know, he's, well, he basically taught us that God has provided all the spiritual protection we need, uh, but when it comes to spiritual attacks, we must assume our responsibility or suffer the consequences. You know, we've learned that, we, you know, we've been told to put on the whole armor of God, to stand firm and to resist. You know, uh, Anderson draws... Uh, that, that was basically from Ephesians, um, Ephesians the six, uh, I believe, six eighteen through something, uh, twenty three or so. Uh, that lists all the, uh, the armor, or, or it could be five. You know, that's if you're playing at home, get your Bible and email me the correct verses. Um, he should know that. Yeah, I should. Um, but you know, that's the great thing about you know being a Christian. We don't have to be perfect. Um, uh, he also draws from other scriptures um, to, to tell us what we've learned. Uh, Romans 13, 14 tells us we were, we were told to put on, the whole, uh, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh um, regarding its lust. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 5 told us to, to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And if that's not your, your, your regular practice as you walk through the world, that's, that's the one, you know, that's it. It's the battlefield of the mind. We got to take those thoughts captive, and uh, you know, have them agree, you know, with you know, in obedience to Christ. Um, the second, uh, the next verse is uh, Romans six twelve through thirteen, um, where he told us, uh, where the Scripture told us, uh, it is our responsibility to not allow sin to reign in our mortal bodies by using our bodies as instruments of unrighteousness. And if you recall that lesson, it was. Sort of like sin's a thing, uh, sort of an entity in, in a sense, because if we allow it in our lives, it'll it'll reign in our bodies and cause us to crave and repeat uh, sin. So uh, we don't surrender our bodies over to sin, and we and we make them instruments of righteousness, not 
righteousness, not unrighteousness. Um, and of course, you know, if, if you're going to remember one one verse uh, for spiritual warfare, you know, James 4, 7 is probably a good verse to remember because we're in that verse we're told to submit to God and resist the devil. And if we do, he will flee from us. Um, you know, that's that's good. So we gave you all that stuff. And now what if we choose not to do that? Um, that's what you're supposed to do. But what if we don't? Uh, you know, can we can we just sort of assume uh, a spiritual no- neutrality like Switzerland, where we just sort of go about our business? A lot of people think they they can. Uh, you know, they don't they don't approach the spiritual things. But I'd say they're you know they're they're in danger uh, because we can't assume a spiritually neutral position without any negative consequences. You know, to believe that Satan won't take advantage of our indecision or indiscretion is scripturally wrong. Uh, and it creates a false hope in us. You know, the, the enemy's not, the enemy, you know, if the enemy's leaving you alone, that means you're you're on his side. Um, or you're just ineffective and he wants you to stay that way. You're not living God's will in your life. Um, you know, and what will happen generally is it, you'll you'll be deceived and you'll, you'll be overcome by something. Sin, inaction, or whatever, you know, sometimes, you know, there's a sin of commission and a sin of omission where we we didn't do the will of the Lord. Um, you know, there's rewards for our works uh, when we when we go into eternity. Uh, that means we should should do something for the kingdom of God. Um, not that we have to earn our place, but our purpose is to walk into the good works that God has uh, prepared for us. Um and uh, Second Peter tells us, you know, um, for by what a man is overcome, by that that this he is enslaved. And you know, the more I've studied study this and taught this uh, these lessons from Victor over the Darkness series and Bondage Breaker series, I realize that the world system really is, um, you know, Satan's playground. Um, you know, all the things that can just distract us from a, a, a life of faith. Uh, there's so so many different things that can just draw us away and, and lead us to live in a way that we're not, you know, living, you know, for optimal health or you know optimal spiritual health uh, in terms of living for God's purposes. Um, and that's that's what we that's what He made us for um, to represent Him. Um, to ins- illustrate how enslaved uh, one can become, Anderson shares a testimony in this chapter um, that he received after a conference uh, in the form of a letter. And the letter says, Dear Neil, I have been set free. Praise the Lord. Yesterday, for the first time in years, the voices stopped. I could hear the silence. When we sang, I could hear myself sing. And I'll just pause, you know, um, in that letter. But... When I went to the Steps in Freedom in Christ, um, I literally, you know, was surprised at the clarity and the silence that came in. Apparently, there's a lot of mental chatter going on in my born-again head. Um, and after I, uh, after I went through the Steps in Freedom, you know, I was surprised by the silence. And uh, that's what this person was uh, was expressing in their letter. Uh, they go on to say, um, for the first 14 years of my life, I lived with an oppressive, abusive mother who never said I love you or put her arms around me when I cried. I received no affection, no kind words, no affirmation, no sense of who I was, only physical and emotional abuse. At 15, I was subjected to three, works, uh, three weeks of Earhart Seminar Training, S Training, which really screwed up my mind. Now, um, what is Earhart Seminar Training? Well, um, if you don't know, which uh, EST training used to be a thing. Um, basically, back this this must be an old letter uh, because uh, Earhart Seminar Training was big in the late 70s and early 80s. This guy, um, Werner Erhard, um, was uh, sort of an inspirational teacher, and he would have conferences. And I didn't really know a lot about the details of what S training was. I remember the term like vaguely, but I had no knowledge of it. Um, so this afternoon, I, I decided to check it out, and um, I, I looked at some videos and I looked at uh, um, you know just this background information on on Mr. Earhart. And um, what 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 it came down to was these trainings that they had were like these big sort of um, 
awareness trainings. So the, you'd pay your money and you would go in and they had this format where 250 people would, would be able, would come in at once. The seminars ran from, this is, and by the way, this isn't stuff I'm making up. This is right from the abstract from uh, Werner Erhard.net um, d- describing what, what it was. Um, basically, they would come in, 250 people and some teacher, um, uh, although they, he wasn't a teacher, as, as I'll, I'll explain, they, they came in, right? And the, the, the seminars would last from 9 a.m. to 12 midnight. And so it's all day and all night. And what do 250 people do uh, for that long? Well, they did get breaks. Uh, there was four-hour breaks. And what would happen is the teacher, although I'm, I'm calling it a teacher, they don't call it a, te- a teacher. I forget the term. But um, basically, they would, they would get up there and they would speak and they would talk about experience. And then they would say things like, and the whole idea behind this S training was to give, not give people knowledge, but to give people an experience. And um, what, an experience of what? Well, basically to sort of shift your paradigms or make you see things. And, and, and it was... If you read the if you read the abstract, it's really sort of like double talk because they sort of talk, talk about things. You are going to know the things you the, the things you already know but didn't know you knew, and so 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 basically, what's that? It's sort of like um, giving people a, a eureka moment of of looking at things differently. And and I have to say, in our concrete culture, our society, where systems and things happen and people think in, in, in black and white, there's not a lot of um, introspection. And that's what this was, you know, looking at your experience and then trying to, you know, think about how you always thought about your life a little differently. And, you know, I recognize where all this came from. You know, um, you know when, you're, when you're looking for an experience to, to get an insight, it's sort of like seeking enlightenment. And sure enough, um, you know, that's a, the enlightenment is generally, you know, associated with a Buddhism. Uh, it's a Buddhism term. And, um, and the way they describe the seminar, I'm like, this is just a, this is just a, a Buddhist meeting where, where people get in and we sit around and we're nice to one another and we just sit and we listen and we, and we think about what we think about. And and try to trigger trigger emotions because within it they would they would the, the people you know the, the instructor would speak and then the people would speak about their experience and then you would listen to them and you'd become part of the community you'd have a relationship with the guy speaking and then you were it was all about your relationship with yourself and you know while it's all well and good to examine our lives and to and to um, uh, seek. You know, new insights, new perspectives, and that's what I teach a lot because um, you know, well, I'm a, I'm a former Buddhist, so maybe that's where I was influenced. But but um, the thing is, you know, looking at yourself, it's like they were just looking at looking. You know, that's that's a Zen term. You know, looking at looking. Um, Zen Zen practice. A lot of people look at like a blank wall and wait for an experience to happen. They'll meditate in front of a white wall, wait for experience. So what happens in this dynamic with S training, which may have freaked this person out, is the fact that they were there for, you know, I don't know how many hours is that. It's 12 hours plus a few more, like 15 hours of, of just hanging out, talking, looking at your own experience. That might have freaked them out because, you know, this... It sort of takes on a, a surreal um, when, when you when you make insight when you look at the way you think and the uh, it can be a disturbing thing to realize that everything I ever believed was wrong and stuff like that where it's not necessarily true. Um, the, the problem with these experiential practices and and I'm looking at the church too here um, for people who are, who are looking at for experience only um, you you're just going to be looking forever and, and there'll be no, there'll be, there'll be no resolution. We need truth. We need, you know, what happens? Yeah. I'm going to spend my life looking at experience and go, wow, look at the thing. It's, 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 it's no more than the sum of its parts. And if everything falls apart, that's great. And, and then you die. And what happens? Well, you were so busy looking at yourself. You didn't, you didn't see where you're going. You didn't see that there was, 
there was a person behind creation, you know, and that person is God, and he sent his son to tell us that, uh, you know, he was the way to go. Um, so that it's very new age, very, very, you know, has Buddhist uh, practice is what Erhard seminar training is. And, uh, you know, basically, like I said, I, I always say examine your experience, but um, where is it leading to? What, where are we going to with this? Um, you know, if you've ever hung out with some hippies or people who are into drugs, everything's peace, love and happiness. And hey, man, let's think about all kinds of different cool things and ponder everything we may do someday. And then we just sit around and get high all day. Um, and nothing is accomplished, nothing, you know, there's nothing but experience. Um, yeah, you can ask me how I know, but my testimony sort of speaks for itself. Um, yeah, so, and like I said, those, those, the, it's sort of, when you go into those exper- into these, these seminars or into, into Buddhist practice or whatever, you're looking at things and, wow, you have these insights. And so what does that do to you? It separates you from everyone else because you think you have the special knowledge, the special insight, the special experience that you are on the way to enlightenment. And, wow, guess what? I'm going to be like God. <laughs> and that was, guess whose original sin? Satan. That's what, he, that's what he did. So, sorry for the long commentary on the S training. It was only one line in the book, but I was like, you know what, let's, let's unpack that. Um, so, she says, um, or I, I don't know if it identifies, but I, I get the feeling this is a woman. She says it really screwed up her mind. Um, and the letter continues, the year that followed was pure hell. My mother threw me out, so I went to live with another family. Eventually, they also threw me out. Three years later, I found Christ. My decision to trust Christ was largely based on my fear of Satan and the power of evil uh, that I had experienced in my life. Even though I knew Satan had lost his ownership of me, I was unaware of how vulnerable I still was to his deception and control. For the first two years of my Christian life, I was in bondage to sin. I didn't even know it was a sin. Once I realized my sin, confessed it to God, and received forgiveness, I thought I was finally free of Satan's attempts to control me. I didn't realize that the battle had only begun. I was a little, I'm very intrigued by this part of the letter because you know she doesn't they they don't say what their sin was. They just said they they had a sin and they didn't know what it was, and it just it, it sort of. As a confirmed sinner, uh, <laughs> um, I, I'm not really sure what they're talking about. Um, so it, it just sort of intrigued me. They didn't know it was a sin, but but they they realized it and confessed it and were forgiven and thought they were ready to roll. But that's funny. I mean, that's a picture of my experience as a Christian too. You come to Christ, you're good, but you're not too mature, and you have sin in your life. And luckily, they gotten got some knowledge about what sin was and repented of one of them. But the battle had only begun. As they go on in their letter, it says, I suffered from unexplainable rashes, hives, and welts all over my body. Um, I'm going to stop on that one. Um, I get rashes all the time. Uh, I don't know if I'm being oppressed or I need to see a dermatologist, but... This is a sign of, of uh, Anderson testified to it in one of the chapters about actually receiving a wound, um, you know, which he which he uh, claims to be from uh, demonic oppression. So, um, you know, they can they can affect us physically, and sometimes, you know, these these rashes can just come and go, and you're like, what is that? You know, like I didn't do anything to get it, and it's and I didn't get anything to lose it. It comes, it goes. I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, this person lost their, their joy and closeness to the Lord. Um, they say, I could no longer sing or quote scripture. That's not a good sign. Um, I turned to food as my comfort and security. And I would say a good deal of America <laughs> um, <laughs> and the church uh, turns to food. Um, the demons attacked my sense of right and wrong, and I became involved in immorality in my search for identity and love. Um, that last sentence, that's, that's about sex right there. Um, uh, identity and love, uh, you want to be accepted, you want to 
You want to be loved? It might, uh, immorality? That's, that's loose relationships. But all that ended yesterday, uh, she, they go on, when I renounced Satan's control in my life. I have found the freedom and protection that comes from knowing I am loved. I'm not on a high. I'm writing with a clear mind, a clean spirit, and a calm hand. Even my previous bondage to food suddenly seems foreign to me. I, I never realized that a Christian could be so vulnerable to Satan's control. I was deceived, but now I am free. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. And, and that's it. I mean, that, you know, we want freedom. And, when, and the key there is renouncing Satan's control in their life. Um, we do come to Jesus, but we also renounce our, our sin and any de- demonic oppression. Um, that's one of the first steps in the steps to freedom in Christ. And just as I, you know, I keep mentioning that, just so you know, in the Bondage Breaker book, the steps to freedom in Christ is in the appendix. Um, you read through the steps, you pray through the steps, you you do what it says, you add your personal information to the steps, and you walk away free. Um, you do it in faith. Now, if you're if you need help going through the steps, Freedom in Christ Ministries can can contact Freedom in Christ Ministries wherever you are. They can get someone local um, to you um, to lead you through the steps. Um, and if you want, you can contact me. Um, my my email is on the the website mtforchrist.org. So, and uh, I could I could lead you through uh, via Zoom if you have a Zoom thing, I guess. But but like I said, if you're a female, I probably would refer you to uh, Freedom in Christ Ministries, um, just because they the the things that are handled and the steps are sensitive, and they usually like to keep things same sex because we want to be accountable as men and women of Christ. Now, this testimony um, is a sobering example of a dimension of spiritual vulnerability that most Christians don't like to talk about: losing control. <laughs> um, Yet every recovery ministry works with people who have lost control of their lives to food, to sex, to drugs, alcohol, and gambling. Uh, When we lose control, life becomes unmanageable. Um, Christians generally agree that we are vulnerable to the enemy, but they hesitate to consider what would happen if we were willfully to surrender to demonic influences. Now, that brings up the question of demonic possession. Um, If a believer believes the devil's accusations, gives into his temptations, and believes his lies, does that mean he or she is demon-possessed? No. <laughs> no, but that person is... It, it, so there's the answer. No, it doesn't mean they're demon-possessed. But that person is likely defeated, stagnant in terms of spiritual growth, and enslaved to sin. Um, yeah, if you're... If all of those things are true, you, uh, that's the vicious cycle that I've talked about, um, basically where you are tempted to sin, you fall into sin, and then you feel bad about sin because they accuse uh, the enemy accuses you, and then he condemns you, and then he tempts you again to make you feel better. And it, and it goes round and round. So, um, yeah. Um, the term demon-possessed, though, in Matthew 424, 932, and 1522, as well as in Mark 515, is translated from the one Greek word daimonozomai or daimonozomenos. Uh, it would it would have been more helpful if the translators had transliterated the word as demonized, meaning to be under the influence of one or more demons. The term never occurs in the epistles, um, so we have no way of knowing precisely how it would apply to the church age. Um, the, problem, the problem word, of course, is possession, which doesn't uh, uh, occur in the original Greek text of the Bible, uh, the New Testament. Um, possession often implies ownership. In that sense, Christians are Holy Spirit possessed. You know, we get the Holy Spirit when we give ourselves to Christ, and um, He dwells within us. Um, we have been bought and paid for, you know, by the blood of the Lamb. We belong to God. You know, uh, we are temples of God, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, who is who will never leave us or forsake us. So we were His. Um, the translators were probably thinking of another aspect of possession, uh, such as whatever possessed you to do that. Um, In other words, what has overcome or influenced you to do that? And I think that's a big earmark of sin. um, That's, you know, you can just, 
You know, sometimes we're not really sure is that there a spiritual battle going on or am I just a bad person? But sometimes if you're walking in sin long enough, you're going to do something that's like above and beyond or really bad. And you'll come away from it filled with guilt and shame and say, why did I do that? And if you replay the tape, you, you, may, you may remember an urge, a voice, uh, an impression to just do it and give in. Um, when I replay the tapes of my sins from the past, I can recall several instances where I got these bizarre, um, bizarre impulses to do something. Um, and in some cases, I did it. And charges were filed. And, uh, you know, so. And guess what? Who's responsible, though? <laughs> me. Uh, so if you're given the temptation, you can't say the devil made me do it. Um, you know, a related Greek phrase that appears in the gospel is eichen daimon, daimonon, uh, which means to have a demon. You know, the, the Jewish religious leaders used this phrase when they accused, um, accused John the Baptist and Jesus of having a demon. Uh, they wrongfully, wrongly assumed that a demon was giving Jesus supernatural power, uh, which enabled them to know what they were thinking and to... Um, and to work miracles. Um, of course, when you claim that Jesus is, is the enemy and he's, he's got his power from a demon, um, you're the one who's deceived. Um, and that's the, the, the big sin of unbelief. That's the unpardonable sin, uh, unbelief. Um, blaspheming, blaspheming the Holy Spirit, as they say, as we, we talked about in a previous lesson. You know, a, a related, uh, let's see, uh, give the fa- given the fact that as believers, our bodies are temples belonging to God, can an evil spirit coexist with the Holy Spirit in us? Can we have two things going on at the same time? Well, Satan is the God of this world, and the Holy Spirit is on the present. So, you know, Satan's got rule and dominion over the earth in some senses, and God is everywhere. So... Uh, if, if we're like the world, I would say yes. You know, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God's beloved Son are coexisting and in conflict all around us. Spatial arguments, uh, you know, don't apply to the spiritual realm. I think there are boundaries and stuff, but we can't count on, you know, like a church sanctuary. Um, especially, you know, if we consider um, from the previous lessons that we've we've discussed, um, the, the the enemy can put thoughts right in our head. You know, so um, if that's the case, uh, and that's backed up by scripture, of course, as we've talked about, um, if that's the case, then anywhere, you know, the enemy, uh, the enemy has access anywhere. Um, and that's why we have to, you know, put on the full armor of God. That's why we have to take every thought captive, because he can, he can come in and try to influence us. You know, there are no natural barriers or physical bound, boundaries for spirits, including our skin. The sole purpose of armor is to stop penetration, to stop them from coming in. Um, if, a, if a person is paying attention to a deceiving spirit, the influence is not limited to the external part of his life. You know, like I said, that's why the battlefield's for the mind. Every testimony in the bondage breaker uh, was written by a professing Christian, you know, who were struggling to win the battle for their minds. Um, you were serving the enemy when you give, you know, when you give your fellow believers a false hope of immunity, saying, "Oh no, no, you can't be bothered by a demon. You're a Christian." Uh, great. Then the only alternative is I'm insane. Uh, no, there's, you know, there's the reality of the spiritual realm that we have to consider. Um, you know, instead, give them hope uh, by telling them that what they, when they repent and believe the truth, they'll be alive and free in Christ. A struggling Christian is like a house filled with overflowing garbage um, that hasn't been taken out in months. You know, uh, guess what? It's going to, you know, a bunch of garbage is going to attract a lot of flies. You know, the need your, and, and what's that? You know, our sin attracts the enemy. Um, you know, he, he would love to keep us in bondage. The knee jerk response is to get rid of the flies, right? You know, oh, all these flies around here. Let's get rid of them. The right answer is to get rid of the garbage. You know, repentance. And faith in God have been, have been, and always will be the right answer throughout this church age. Uh, yeah, you want to get set free. You could ask someone to pray for you, or you could repent and start, you know, praying for yourself. 
and walking away from the darkness that that's, has you locked up. Um, some some deliverance ministries um, study the flight patterns of the flies. You know, they 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 study demons. Um, they'll call up the demons and ask them their names and ranks and cast them out. You know, that was what Anderson uh, heard from others, and that's what he tried to do in the beginning of his career. Um, but it doesn't make sense to gather information from demons. Why? <laughs> well, they, they're, they're demons. They would lie to us. You know, we should never believe deceiving spirits. Uh, the moment we dialogue with them, uh, we cut off the person that we're trying to help. The person we're trying to help is, is being totally bypassed. We're talking to the demon. Um, in his testimonies of, of when he's interacting with demons, Anderson said that afterwards the person didn't remember any of the interaction at all. Um, so yeah, we're bypassing that person. The person won't recall anything that happened during the session. And no human agent can take another person's garbage out. Yeah. I can talk to you and I can teach to you and I can encourage you and I can pray for you until, until Jesus calls me home. But until you decide to follow the Lord and surrender to him and give up your stuff, you know, you're, you're, you're just going to be run over by the enemy continually. Um, that's the personal responsibility aspect that I really enjoy about this ministry is the fact that we are here for one another. We'll pray for one another. But, that, you know, uh, it's your walk with the Lord and you have to um, you have to walk it out. Um, you can ask for help. That's a good thing. Um, but you must you must walk out your walk by yourself. Um, but the good thing is you're never by yourself because the Lord's with you. Um, you know, the, let's see. You know, and if so, in those deliverance ministries, what what generally happens is is they'll cast out the, the enemy, and you know they'll they'll be back. You know, if we ma- we actually manage to expel a demon, they just go. You know, as, as Scripture tells us, Jesus told us about um, how the enemy go, leaves its home and then goes out and finds seven other spirits more more evil than itself, and so. You know, they'll just go out and say, "Hey, there's the garbage. In, the garbage is over here. You know, the sins in, in this guy. Let's uh, let's go in together." Um, and then they're a legion. Um, <laughs> there are no instructions in the epistles for the, the that methodology, that the deliverance methodology. Now, what is the epistles? The epistles are the letters from the apostles and, and the early church leaders um, to the saints, the church members. So if if we they want if they were casting out demons like that, there would be all kinds of instructions uh, to tell you how, how to cast out demons, you would think. But there's nothing like that in the epistles. And Paul Paul taught a different approach. Um, the deliverer is Christ, right? And he has already come. We should be getting inform- our information from the Holy Spirit who, le- who will guide us into all truth, and that is the truth that will set us free. Um, you know, that perspective is actually taught in Scripture in 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. And the, the text says, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, be able, able to teach, patient when wronged. Okay, that's the guy, that's us. We're, we're the bondservant. Uh, we shouldn't fight with people, and we should be kind and able to teach and patient when wrong. With gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil having been held captive by him to do his will. And, you know, to break that down, yeah, with gentleness, we're going to be correcting the guy who's in opposition. That means he's walking outside the, the, the will of the Lord, okay? Um, he might even be against us, who knows? But it says opposition. And it says, if perhaps God may grant them repentance. So if you want to repent, it's it, the true repentance is turning to God and having him, you know, asking him to help you 
as you take walk away from your sin, walk away from your darkness. And that's when the supernatural stuff happens. That's when the guy gets set free from drugs and alcohol and never goes back. That's when somebody says no to their sexual sin and never never turns again. Because they draw close to the Lord, establish a relationship that's deep and meaningful, and then the Lord gives them the power and and the love that they need in order to see the light and, and get set free. And it says, leading to the knowledge of the truth. So what's the truth? I am free from my sin. We already are free. I just have to believe it and walk it out. And, and if I need help, ask the Lord to help me. Um, and then it says they come to their senses. Yes, you come to your senses. And then what? Escape from the snare of the devil, who's, who's been held, who's had, having been held captive to by him to do his will. So there you go. These are, and that's a letter to the church talking about the devil. If you want a devil verse, you know, uh, for the church, there it is. So it's saying that it can affect us, but what we can do is correct our brothers and guide them to repentance. And if they do so, they can really walk free of their sin. Um, we're not talking about sinless perfection, but we are talking about victory. And guess what? Like, like if he grants you repentance, you are free. And, you know, if we want to talk about recovery ministry, they, a lot of people say uh, recovery, you know, relapse is part of recovery. Now, there's grace for that, but I'm telling you, uh, relapse has no part in freedom. Um, you know, that's where we need to stop doing it in our own will and ask the Lord to grant us repentance because you can walk free. There's people who have. Um, and I, I've experienced that myself. There's sort of a before and after story to my whole recovery. First half was like a lot of <laughs> a lot of white knuckling it, and then the Lord granted me repentance. And now I can, you know, walk free and, and don't think of anything of it. And, you know, like I said, when that happens, the way I describe it is, First, you, you know the bad consequences. They, they were never pop, you know, un, enough to make you turn before. Um, but then what you need to do is learn who you are in Christ. Hey, I am free. And, you know, grow close to the Lord. So you don't want to sin anymore because you know those bad consequences. You know who you are in Christ, so it doesn't match up. It's not compatible with who you are now. Um, and it gets between you and God, who you love and appreciate and don't want to have anything separate you from him. You know, so God grants you repentance. You go get it. Um, the first prerequisite is to be the Lord's bond servant. You must be a Christian. Uh, we need to be totally dependent upon God because he is the only one who can set a captive free and heal the wounds of the brokenhearted. And that's the truth. Otherwise, you're just covering it up and you're probably doing the coping mechanisms or whatever. Um, but he can, he, can, he can heal our hearts. You know, what sets Christian ministry apart from secular work is the presence of God, or it should. Um, some Christian counselors are no different from any secular thing. They just say they're Christian. Yes, I believe the Bible. Now let's, you know, do all the therapy that doesn't include God in your life. Um, no. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's why I am a, such a, a fan and student of uh, Anderson, um, because... He understands the power of God and in the ability to set people free from, you know, really any problem. Um, we must understand that it's what God's role is and what our role is. You know, there is a precise line uh, between God's sovereignty and human responsibility. Um, the line will appear a little blurred to us, and the Calvinists and Arminians will uh, adjust it to the left or right. However, both theological perspectives acknowledge that scripture teaches God's sovereignty and human responsibility. It's not one or the other. Um, there's a little bit of both. Um, we can be creative, but we can't speak and bring something into existence out of nothing. You know, we, can, we can't even save ourselves or others. You know, that, those things are obviously God's responsibility. Um, God created the universe, and he accomplishes his purposes by working through his created order. Yeah, um, so he put us all here in the universe. So how could God? How how could God save us? He's he's you know over and above it all. But what's he going to do? Well, he's got to work through his natural order. So thus, 
will bring Jesus Christ to the earth. That's how he worked through it. And now he's got our, he's got the church, and now he's going to set us out there to tell people about Jesus and to do good works for his kingdom. So he's working through us in the natural order. Um, the providence of God refers to his direction and care over all creation. So yeah, he's working through it, but like I said, he's over and above it all. Um, God upholds all things by the world by the word of his uh, his power says Hebrews 1 3 he is the ultimate reality you know if the, what 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 is there beyond all this well he's the ultimate reality uh, and if we and if he disappeared so would all creation you know in the Eric McTaxick's book miracles the, the one of the most compelling arguments for for God is the mere fact of our existence and specifically life on earth because uh, and you, I, I recommend the book highly and I would tell you to check out those chapters on on just the miracle of us because as for science fiction there ain't no aliens um, um, of course I, I am convinced um, basically by Eric Metax's book which which speaks of the science of, of the ability to sustain life on a planet um, that it's like basically it's it's virtual it's virtually impossible for uh, for for life to exist, but yet we do, um, and so get that book, um, and, or be like me, get the audio book. You can listen to it in a few hours and just sit there and just awe. You know, it was it was so good. Um, so yeah, he's ultimate reality. There's you know we we fulfill our purpose when we live in harmony with him. Um, we do that by knowing him and his ways and living accordingly by faith. Um, you know, we got God's sovereignty on one side and human responsibility on the other side. Um, everything on, on the right side, which is the human, <laughs> human responsibility, you can't see me pointing, um, is, is the line that depicts human responsibility. You know, we are either ignorant or irresponsible when asked when we ask God to do for us what he told us to do. Um, yeah. And yeah, so we'll pray to God for things that we actually have in our power. Um, you know, for instance, if you have a Bible quiz tomorrow, you can't ask God to study for you. Although I'm sure he would get a perfect score because it's his word. Um, you must do that by yourself to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed. Second Timothy 2.15 you know, don't ask God to think for you either, because He told you in Romans 12:3 to think so as to have sound judgment. Uh, how do we get sound judgment? Well, we follow the standard. Uh, God's Word tells us what's true, and we use that as our guide. You know, we must assume responsibility for our own attitudes and actions, and that's where you know. Well, I didn't know any better. Well, you're still responsible. Um, you know, God puts put the creation out there. He put His Son out there. And, you know, if you're ignorant of it, that's one thing. And to disregard it is being irresponsible. So, um, you know, suppose there's a problem person in your church, for instance. And, you know, they're, they're, and, and everybody wants them out. And so we pray to God to get rid of them. Uh, and nothing happens. Why not? Because God, you know, told us in Scripture, basically, there was a process to deal with deal with someone in, in our churches that need, need to be dealt with. Um, you know, he, of course, he loves his church and he wants it to to function properly. So he t basically tells us to go to the person and if they don't repent, then you're to bring two or more witnesses to confront the person. And if they, you know, if they still don't repent, that's when you remove them from the fellowship. Um, it, there's no repentance. You know, will, will God bail us out if we don't carry out our responsibilities? Not necessarily. Um, I say, I'd say we can't count on it. Um, if He's told you to do something and you don't do it, there will be consequences. You know, suppose a person's frightened. You know, we talked about this: the person in the room with a spiritual attack, um, some spiritual manifestation comes in, and they cry out. You know, they cry out, "God, do something!" and nothing happens. Um, well, what are they supposed to do? Well, as we taught in a previous lesson, we're supposed to say something like, well, first we've got to be dependent on God, Lord God. You say, pray, you pray it, Lord God, Heavenly Father, I'm dependent on you. Uh, I'm yours. And then you say to the enemy, 
you know, I am a child of God. Uh, the evil one cannot touch me. <laughs> Depart from me, Satan. You know, that, that's the that's the go-to cast-out verse. Um, so, so that's your responsibility. Um, you have to be use the power that He's given us. You know, you can't just hide under the covers and wonder why aren't you helping me? Um, don't you love me? Maybe I'm not a Christian, or why why hasn't why hasn't God answered my prayer? Well, that, unfortunately, that's the mental state of most pe- mental and emotional state of most people. They question God's presence, question His love for them, and question their salvation. You know, why didn't God do something? Well, are you are you in harmony with Him, with His will? Um, you know, maybe that maybe there's something there. Um, and, and guess what? And you know, what? some of these big questions we're not going to be able to answer. Uh, you know, why do people suffer? Well, guess what? We're all going into eternity to get, die, so your suffering is only for a time. Uh, uh, whether or not you're with Jesus, that's that's when you really suffer. Um, you know. Because bad things happen on earth because it's broken by sin. Um, I know. Trauma, um, loss, heartache, you know, these things happen to everybody. So why, you know, why did this happen? Well, why not? Um, we're in the realm of sin and, and chaos and bad things are going to happen. We should just thank the Lord it didn't happen to us today. And uh, that's, why we, that's why we pursue the Lord, to get peace in the storm, you know. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, why didn't Why didn't he do something? Well, he did. He disarmed the devil. He forgave us our sins. He made us new creations in Christ, and he positioned us with Christ in the heavenly realms at the Father's right hand. So we have power, authority, and uh, purpose. Uh, whose responsibility is it to submit to God and resist the devil? Whose responsibility is to put on the armor of God, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, stand firm in the faith, and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lust? We are. Uh, you know, can we assume that there'd be no question, negative consequences if we don't carry out our responsibility? No, we can't. Um, will God bail us out if we don't? Uh, we can hope so, but uh, it's better to stand in who we are in Christ and uh, meet our responsibilities. And, uh, you know, when we, when we help another individual, and this is basically sort of looking at um, discipling, and it's looking at the steps to freedom in Christ specifically, when we help another visual, uh, individual, we, we do so with the awareness that God is always present. And God is always present. He's omnipresent. And in every relationship, um, there's a role that God and only God can play in the other person's life. On the, on the right side of the line, uh, um, imagine there's a diagram, okay, with God at the top, uh, a, a disciple or inquirer on the right, and encourager on the left. Um, you know, on the right side of the line, is the, in, the, in, the, in the diagram, there's another role relationship that exists, and that is between the encourager and the inquirer, or the discipler and the disciple. You know, and and in this triangle, God's God's at the top, as I said. Each side of the triangle represents a relationship. You know, the most important one is my relationship with God. We need to make sure that the barriers to an intimate relationship with God, um, that there are no barriers to an intimate relationship to God, um, and, and that that we've repented and uh, from our sin and we believe in Him. Um, it is also very important, you know, how we relate to the inquirer. You know, that love your neighbor too, right? Love God, love your neighbor. Um, secular counselors, of course, as we said, don't use, don't focus on God, so they focus all their attention on their relationship with their, with their, with the client, um, because God is is just out of it. And he's never even considered. Most counselors are taught not to be a rescuer, enabler, or codependent. Um, you know, the picture of counselors is usually they just sit there and let the person talk, and that's great. But you know, I've had I've heard stories of people who've gone to to therapy um, where nothing happened <laughs> because uh, one of the stories is you know I'll share. Um, my son saw a counselor for a while and. He told me that whenever he went to see his, his therapist, he would go in and talk about video games. And that's all he did. 
And my son, to this day, will talk to me about video games on and on and on. And guess what? It's not really getting into the heart of anything. Um, Granted, the conversation gives you a platform to insert things, but a therapist isn't going to really insert anything. Um, They'll just ask more questions, and he'll tell them about the ninth level or or whatever uh, is happening in the video games. I had another friend, uh, an adult, um, um, and uh, his background basically didn't really trust people. I'm not sure how he ended up in therapy, but he just sort of played mind games with the therapist. He just told him whatever he felt like talking about and made up lies. Um, So, you know... Uh, so we, we want to bring God into the relationship to, to do away with the nonsense and, 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 and speak truth. As I said, the first principle of, of discipleship or a relationship with God is, is we are people of the truth. Um, we speak the truth. And if you're living, you know, playing games and lying, you know, just repent and start telling the truth. It's liberating. That's the first step of freedom. Um, just freedom from the lies your own lies, you know. So the, the third side of the triangle is, is, is a relationship with that person the inquirer has, has or doesn't have with God. Our goal as an encourager or a discipler, obviously, is to help the inquirer have an intimate personal relationship with their Heavenly Father, Father through genuine repentance and faith in Him. Now you see that, um, you know, God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. The whole world is in the kingdom of darkness because of the fall, and God's plan was to destroy the works of the devil and present every believer uh, complete in Christ. Um, you know, um, I believe it's in Mark, uh, one of the one of the first verses in, 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 in the book of Mark, Jesus comes on the scene and says, uh, repent and believe in the gospel. There's your two steps. You know, we have to return or, or repent of our sins and uh, believe in the gospel. So then guess who's the gospel? Jesus Christ. Um, he's the good news. The, the whole world is in, king, in the kingdom of darkness, and we have to turn from those works of the devil and, you know, become complete in Christ. With the triangle in mind, ask yourself, who's responsible for what? You know, a lot of problems in our homes, marriages, ministries, would disappear if we had a balanced answer to that question. Um, have you ever tried to play the role of the Holy Spirit in someone's life? Um, basically telling them everything they're doing wrong and everything they need to do and everything they need to change? Uh, usually it doesn't work. Um, you know, It doesn't work in marriages. It doesn't work in family relationship. It doesn't work at work. Um, whenever you come at someone with criticism or, or suggestions, you know, the first the first knee jerk reaction is to resist. Um, you can't tell me what to do. You know, how does that work for you? You can't be the Holy Spirit. You know, there is a sovereign role that God and only God can play in the life of another, and we will mess up the process if we take over God's role. Have you ever tried to assume other people's responsibilities? You know, they won't think for themselves and they, or make decisions for themselves, so you do their thinking and deciding for them. Um, I can say in, in my my previous relationship, um, out of a, out of total exasperation, uh, I surrendered my will. Uh, you know, didn't make any didn't make any decisions. Whatever you say is fine. What do you want for dinner? It doesn't matter. It didn't matter to me. Um, I wasn't really controlled by circumstances. So for me, it was like whatever you whatever makes you happy, dear. Um, it didn't make her happy. Um, it only exasperated the issue. So, if if you're if you have a relationship like that, I, I suggest getting some help, because um, because mine mine's over. Um, you know they won't. Uh, so yeah, you don't want to take over someone's personal responsibilities. Uh, it just makes things worse. Um, doing that makes them dependent on you instead of God. And some people are perfectly, uh, and I wasn't exactly perfectly you know, content laying back and letting them say everything. I was just trying to keep the peace. But some people just say, yeah, just do everything for me. Um, yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was the picture of my marriage in the beginning. I said, hey, I'm a drunk. You just take care of everything, okay, honey? And, you know, that worked. You know, a, a stirring testimony from a friend of mine uh, who had a broken relationship too. Um, he was a drunk like I was, and uh, he, he basically um, 
He was with a woman who's somewhat domineering, and he decided to get sober. And at one point, she said something to him like, I like it when you're drunk. And he's like, why is that? And he's like, you're easier to control. And so if you're, if you're, if you're on that end of the relationship where you're the one who's, who does everything wrong, um, it, might not be as, it might not be as black and white as you think. Um, you know, some people keep you in bondage um, by feeding your addictions. So uh, walk away. Uh, get free. You know, Jesus said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Here it is. Repent and believe in the gospel. Mark 1, 15. Gee, I, I thought I, I remembered that. It's right in the lesson. Uh, the big question is this. Do, do we really believe that repentance and faith in God are how we resolve personal and spiritual conflicts? Uh, the answer is no, if we take uh, each other's roles and fail to include God in the process. The, yeah, if we're just, you know, you do everything I say and we'll be happy. You know, uh, that's, you're, suddenly you're God. Um, the answer is yes, if we acknowledge God's role and assume responsibility for, uh, uh, for, for, for ours. You know, we do our job and let God do his. Um, he sets the standard and we try to, we try to, we try to live according to it, not because we want to follow rules, but because we know that he has the way that leads to life everlasting. And peace, you know, the fruit of the Spirit grow when we follow the Lord. When, when we can help other people, we do so with the realization that there are three parties present. You know, God, ourselves, and the other person. Um, the first thing we do is to make sure that we are in a right relationship with God. So um, in this process, we would pray, Lord, I come before your presence with thanksgiving. I declare my dependence upon you because I believe that apart from Christ, I can accomplish nothing. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit and guide me into all truth. You know, in addition, we should strive to make sure that we are always kind and gentle and patient with the people we try to help. Um, but yeah, we want to make that declaration of dependence on the Lord first to make sure we're right, you know, um, before we try to help someone else. It's, it's the old airplane analogy, put on your oxygen before, you know, you put on your neighbors. Um, you got to be right with God before you try to help anyone. Otherwise, you're just going to be, you know, complicating things. Uh, to help other people assume their responsibility and to ensure lasting results, we, you know, in this process of the Steps of Freedom in Christ and what we're doing here in this, this freedom ministry is that we're teaching people the, the victory over the darkness and the bondage breaker. And that's what we, we try to do. We say, hey, you want to get free? Check out these resources, learn this stuff, and then we can take you through the steps. This is like this is all supposed to lead to something. Um, you know, there won't be much success if people aren't willing to assume some responsibility for their own freedom and growth. You know, that's the old you know I'll get in the prayer line again ministry over and over and over and he keeps praying. That, he, he keeps praying, but I'm still a mess. Like, uh, yeah, he, he can only pray for you so long, and then you walk out the door and just live your life, uh, you know, acting a fool. Um, yeah, the prayers probably aren't going to help unless God strikes you dead. Uh, <laughs> because he's not going to... The only thing that's going to stop my sin uh, is a lightning bolt. So, you know, uh, yeah, we ha have to assume if we really want freedom, you know, if you really want recovery, if you really want victory, if you really want healing, you have to pursue it and you have to renew your mind. That's why we, we, we recommend those resources first. You know, that responsibility also enables them to maintain their freedom afterward because guess what? You know, you're going to be challenged after you receive your freedom because you'll have your freedom and you go, oh my God, it's so good. And then temptation comes and you go, oh, I guess I'm not free. No, 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 no. We got to fight. Uh, the fight doesn't end, but the victory <laughs> lasts forever. Um, so there. Um, however, some people in, are in such serious bondage, when we do recognize that, that they can't read a book. They can't read the Bible. Um, they're a complete mess. And if we, if we see that, we can still lead them through the steps to freedom in Christ. It's just we're going to have to set, a, set enough time uh, aside to instruct them as they go through it. And... Uh, you know, the nature of the battle, for, we have to teach them the nature of the battle of their mind and how, how they continue to grow. You know, 
After hearing an inquirer's story, we should always ask if they would like to resolve their issues. Um, you got to ask, you know, would you like to be, you know, Jesus asked it. We, we should ask it too. Do you want to be healed? Yes. Um, you know, let's, let's get away from this pool. <laughs> um, the angel's not going to stir up the waters to heal you, buddy. You can't even get in there. Uh, do you want to be healed? Yes. Pick up your mat and let's go. Uh, no one else, you know, and, and when we're, when we're at this point, you know, if we're dialogue, dialogue, logging with someone about, being set free, when we ask them if they want to resolve their issues, they will say yes. Um, then, and then we as encouragers would say the following text, and this this comes right from uh, it might be a paraphrase, but it's more or less right from the uh, the steps of freedom in, in Christ. And so we're going to sit them down, right? We're ready. It's go time. Um, and we say, with your permission, I will lead you through the steps of freedom in Christ. What is going to happen here today is not based on what I do. But what you do, and just a note there, um, you know, that's it. That's the responsibility. It's, it's. I'm going to encourage you. You're going to go through these steps, and you're going to ask God to help you, and the Holy Spirit's going to be right there to lead people through. I've seen it in action. Um, I've been on both sides of the table, and uh, the Holy Spirit is definitely the one running the show. Um, what we also say to him is, uh, we tell the inquirer, I need one major cooperation from you. If you have any thoughts contrary to what we are trying to do, share them with me. Uh, we go on to tell them, these thoughts could be condemning, threatening, intimidating, vulgar, or blasphemous. They are just thoughts, and they have no control over your, you unless you believe them. Uh, the best way to maintain control is to expose them to the light. You may not sense any spiritual opposition, but I want you to be prepared in case we experience some interference with what we are doing. So we prep them, you know, before the battle's in the mind, so we want to tell them to report whatever thoughts they have. Uh, so we'll know what's going on, because when, when they come into that situation, they'll think things like, uh, I want to leave, or this, is, this isn't going to help, uh, you know, or all kinds of things. Um, uh, some people in this process have heard stuff like, if we stay here, your kids are going to die. Um, if you stay here, um, I'll kill you, or whatever. You know, these threatening voices or impressions come, and uh, or the or the person leading you through is evil or no good. You know, so um, that's why we want to have them report their thoughts, so we can we can say, oh no, that's not true. Um, let's continue. You know, it's important to pay close attention to the inquirer. Uh, if we see their eyes staring, starting to cloud over or look around the room, we need to get their attention immediately. Even in the most difficult cases, we, we don't have to lose control. Um, some people have been conditioned uh, <laughs> to have a thought and then carry it out. Like I said, that's why we want them to report it. It's like they get a thought to leave and they leave. Uh, so we want to try to try to tell them no. Um, you know, so and and believe me, um, I've been I, I've been in jail ministry, and I actually had one guy say that we can't control our thoughts, and we just ha- if you think it, you do it. Um, it may seem to them that they have no control, but in reality, everyone does. Um, the level of control uh, obviously is what you believe and and what you can control. Um, some have reported that they never even consider the possibility that they don't have to obey the thoughts in their heads. Like I said, the guy in jail, it just you know, obviously he had a lot to say and he was a very wise person, but he was behind bars. And, you know, I said, well, uh, we got to consider what you're thinking uh, and maybe change those thoughts so we don't end up back in here. Um, we are to tell them, uh, you know, if a thought comes to your mind telling, telling you to do something, don't do it, just share it. The power is broken the moment the thought is brought into the light. Whatever they say, we, uh, whatever they share, you know, we'll say thank you for sharing that. And then just keep continuing with the steps. Uh, in extreme cases, some inquirers go catatonic. You know, uh, Anderson shared that. Uh, we talked about it a couple lessons ago uh, with a woman went catatonic and the pastor was there and her fiancé were there. And they had to repent. And uh, sure enough, they, they set her free. Um, but if someone should go catatonic, um, we say out loud, Satan, you have no authority here. You can open your eyes now. And the inquirer will. You know. um, 
You know, some are so uncertain about their ability and extent uh, of their their will in, in, in the past, Anderson will, like, take them on a walk um, just to show them you have the will and you can exercise it. You know, you're not under, you might be oppressed, but you're not possessed, you know. Others may feel nauseous. Um, the enemy wants to get you out of there, so he might make you start to feel sick. Um, maybe the whole idea of repenting in general is going to make you sick. Um but if you share that, we would say, you know, thank you for sharing that. The nauseous feeling will be gone when we're done. And that has been true in every case that Anderson has handled. Um, one case that Anderson had was in Romania. Uh, he was asked by a missionary to help a man addicted to pornography. He was working through an interpreter, which is always, you know, makes the process more difficult. Uh, when they started going through the step, the man's eyes, you know, rolled upward into his head and he started making a strange noise in his lips. The impression in the room was so heavy that uh, Anderson let, him, let the man go on for a bit. And then he said, you don't have to do that, but if you want to, you, you can. You, you can. Uh, and so suddenly the man just stopped. Um, when they realize they have control, they can step in and take it back. Uh, you know, a pastor asked if Anderson would help him with a lady who was addicted to drugs for 20 years. You know, he listened as she shared her story, and it appeared that her legs were cramping because she kept massaging them. You know, one could easily be fooled into thinking it was just a, a response to uh, withdrawal from the drugs. As soon as they started, though, she said, I have to get out of here, and she left. At least she report, I guess she reported it, um, but she got, immediately got up and left. And the pastor's looking at Anderson, going like, "Now what?" And, but Anderson been in, been there, be, you know, been been in this uh, situation before, and he said she's probably right outside the door. Why don't you go ask her if she wants to come back in? Sure enough, she was, and she did. You know, Anderson reminded her that she was supposed to share any thoughts that arose in her head and her mind, so they could help her get through the steps. When they finished the steps, the woman's inner voices were gone and the cramping in her legs stopped. Now, it was very important to understand that going through the steps is just a beginning. You know, um, I've been personally, I've been through the steps three times, so I can tell you it can be great. You know, like I said that first time, though, for real, uh, a lot, a lot less mental chatter. I was like, wow. Um, the second time when I was led through it, um, through by someone in uh, Freedom in Christ Ministries, boy, did we clean house. Um, you know, it's one thing to go through them by yourself. It's another thing to be led through them. And then the third time in training, again, uh, you know, and it was shortly after the second time. But, you know, you, you've, the Holy Spirit leads you into all truth. And as you repent, he'll bring up stuff that's still in there that he needs to get rid of. Like I said, it was amazing. You know, the, the experience of going through the steps, uh, being led through them, was amazing, because, you know, as the as the encourager, you're sitting there over there worried that the person's going to have a demonic manifestation or that you're not going to do everything right. But as you go through the steps, you realize, oh, 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 the Holy Spirit's here, and all the work's happening on the other side of the table. I just have to be faithful to go through it and be open to what the Holy Spirit tells me as I lead the person through the steps. Because then, you know, because he's going to work through his natural creation, right? And I'm part of his natural creation. I'm his child. I'm here to help somebody. And I can, I can, I can be a conduit for the Holy Spirit to tell this person, you know, okay, easy now or whatever. Um, and, and it happens because not all, like I said, all like I said, now I don't want to give the impression I just sat back and like watched the person do all the work because I, I too um, was moved to ask questions and um, you know, that, that opened up, you know, you ask a question and suddenly like the, you open up a can of worms, but that's okay. We're here to deal with the worms and get the worms out or the flies in this case. Um, but, but like I said, this, this redemptive process of prayer and renunciation is what, what this, uh, this, this thing's all about. And it really is an encounter with God. Um, if you want to help others experience their freedom in Christ, you can learn how to lead people through the steps to freedom in Christ through Anderson's book, Discipleship Counseling. 
Reddit, um, <laughs> um, and also I went through the training um, for to become a Community Freedom Ministry Associate. Uh, I have my uh, business cards coming soon. Um, I graduated from the program, and I've been approved, and I'm now on the website. So if you want to see what I look like, go to F- FICM.org and look under the northeast quadrant of CFMAs, and you'll see M.T. Clark from Stuyvesant. Um, so there you go. Uh, let's see, you know, and Anderson has also used this process in other ways. You know, people have often asked if choirs need, well, before we get there, uh, people often ask if inquirers still need counseling after they go through the steps of their freedom in Christ. That depends on the case, of course. Uh, the short answer is that to maintain one's freedom in Christ, the successful inquirer should seek a local church to attend and serve uh, where they can be discipled and live according to a Christian worldview. You know, the antidote to our freedom is faith and continuous faith. Um, yeah, you can't say, oh, thank you for being free. I'll go back to my secular life. I'm like, yeah, I think you missed something. I think we missed something big. Um, and I get it, you know. As somebody who was outside the church, and we're talking about outside a couple churches in a different religion, uh, somebody who was an atheist, I know what it's like to like be integrated into the Christian culture. And you sometimes feel outside or alone or, or whatever. But this is the you know the church is the house where you learn to grow and practice your faith for real. Um, Anderson's view Anderson views discipleship and counseling as the same ministry. You know, a good Christian discipler is a good counselor and vice versa. You know, he's, uh, he's also written books, I was starting to say he's written books on marriage and ministry uh, to help people reserve, uh, resolve their uh, personal and spiritual conflicts to the genuine repentance and faith in God. Um, if your church is full of people in bondage of sin and, and, or there are bare marriages, uh, you have a, bond, a church bondage situation. The whole can't be greater than the sum of the parts. Trying to help a marriage work when both parties have unresolved conflicts is like trying to help two people on crutches learn how to dance. Yeah, yeah. like I said, we have to resolve our personal issues and then we have to deal with the uh, dynamics between a, a man, a, a husband and a wife. Um, even if both both spouses have resolved their own problems, they gotta they gotta you know figure out how to communicate and, and work that out. And his book on marriage is surprisingly called Setting Your Marriage Free. Um, Anderson has also had the privilege of leading top faculty and administrators in the seminary. Um, In a seminary, the executives of two well-known global ministries and many churches through the steps to setting your ministry free. So your ministry's got a problem, he's got a book for that. Every Christian organization has corporate conflicts that can be resolved through repentance, which he explains in setting your church free. So in all cases, Anderson is not the wonderful counselor, as he said in his books. Um, and he's not the church consultant. You know, Jesus is, is the one. He's Jesus. Oh, by the way, if you didn't know, the bondage breaker, who is that? It's Jesus. Um, all seven letters to the churches in Revelations chapters 2 and 3 end with the same statement. He who has an ear, let him hear what the church uh, spirit says to the churches. You know, is, Are the churches listening is the question. Um, Anderson closes the bondage breaker with an encouraging letter from an interim pastor. And this sort of points out the, the group corporate uh, healing that can happen. Uh, through through this message of freedom that Anderson uh, uh, is, is drawn from the Word of God, uh, the letter says, "I purchased a set of Neil CDs on resolving personal and spiritual conflicts. After listening to them, I began applying his principles to my problems. I realized that some of my problems could be spiritual attacks, and I learned how to take a stand and won victories over some of my problems in my life. But that was only a tip of the iceberg." Uh, I'm a deacon and a preacher in a Baptist church. My pastor was suffering from depression and other problems that I was not aware of, and he committed suicide. This literally brought our church to its knees. I knew of some of the problems of the previous pastors and felt the issues were spiritual in nature, but I didn't know how to relay that to the people because supposedly, in their denomination, uh, the devil or a demon cannot affect a Christian, right? Right. 
the church elected uh, the church elected me their interim pastor. While in a bookstore, I saw your book setting your church free, and I, so I, I purchased it and read it. I felt that with all the spiritual suppression taking place in our church, this was the answer. There was only one problem: how to get others in the church to see this as well. After a few weeks of preaching on spiritual issues, I know we had to we had to follow the instructions in your book, setting your church free. The pa- previous pastor who had killed himself would not have believed your material. He would have never had read or listened to your message. Slowly, very slowly, the people listened to my messages, and I was able to contact one of your staff. He flew to Houston and led the the leaders of our church through the steps. Uh, of set, to setting your church free. The leaders loved it. I felt step one was now behind us. Next, I wanted to take all the people through the steps to freedom in Christ. Six weeks later, I was able to do so. Uh, I don't understand exactly what, what all happened, um, but we were, we were set free from the spiritual bondage on, uh, of multiple problems. I can't put it in a letter or I would write a book. During all this, one of our middle-aged members, who was an evangelist, was set free. He learned who he was in Christ and is now back in ministry. Praise the Lord. I saw the daughters of the deceased pastors set free and able to forgive their father, and they were able to move on with their lives. At one point, one of the daughters was contemplating suicide. This is a new church. God is is free to work here. In September, we found our... uh, founded our pulpit committee. Our church voted 100% for our new pastor. This has never happened in our church before. And this is an independent, fundamental Baptist church. Well, when you do things God's way, you get God's results. I also work one night a week in our county jail, which is the second largest in the country. I work with with the homosexual men, and I've seen many set free. So that's a stirring testimony of, of, of the power uh, that God gives us when we, um, we go through the, the process of repentance and renunciation that this, the this steps to freedom uh, gives us. And um, if, you know, if somehow you've gotten to this point in listening to the podcast, reading the books and everything, and haven't peeked ahead to the steps to freedom in Christ, and say you are now, <laughs> you are now ready to, uh, to to do the steps. And uh, I always, you know, uh, check them out. Um, you know, they're in the back of the bondage breaker. I will be sharing a link to a free PDF um, of the steps to freedom in Christ on, on mtforchrist.org tonight um, when I upload the the, the podcast. Um, however, you know, we are. We are going to be doing a Freedom in Christ um, course coming up here at Rock Solid Church. Um, basically, that's taught by the, the people from Freedom in Christ Ministry. It's going to be a video discussion type of uh, format we're going to work with. Um, for the people listening on the podcast, don't worry. Um, it's the MT for Christ 24-7 podcast. So... Um, As I do the video series here in the church, I'll probably podcast the the lessons in the voice of M.T. Clark um, for anyone listening online because I'm such an egomaniac. Uh, And plus, I I don't know. I I, I can't podcast a video. So so I've already prepared all the lessons to be read. uh, So I'll probably, I guess I just said I would. Uh, I'm going to continue. When I do that series, I will... I will simultaneously do the video series here at the church and uh, podcast all the lessons um, with my own input. Because as I wrote them, uh, uh, wrote them out, basically they ask you to share or, or use their stories, and some of their stories I didn't like, so I used my stories. Um, so that'll be a struggle too, a humbling struggle to watch the videos and not get up and preach. Um, you know, we have to grow, <laughs> grow in our freedom. And uh, sometimes that's just sitting back and letting somebody else preach, uh, letting somebody else teach, uh, you know, being patient, being kind, being compassionate. Um, I'm working on all those things. But uh, I'm very encouraged um, by the feedback I've gotten from the, from people about the podcast, about the Bible study, um, people following the podcast, uh, people reading the blog. Um, people who have approached me for 
discipleship uh, lessons and or want feedback. Um, I'm very humbled, and I, and I and I will be faithful to uh, any requests. So, um, if you want to want to go through these courses that we podcast and get all the materials and get feedback, um, just email me at mtforchrist247 at gmail.com. Um, that concludes the Bondage Breaker series uh, this time around. And uh, I just will close us in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, bringing us to this place where we've, we've, we've stood against the powers of darkness um, by, by teaching a message that tells us where we stand as, as Christians and the power that we possess through the bondage breaker, Jesus Christ. Um, Lord, we just we just pray for everyone listening to this lesson uh, that they that the Holy Spirit has given them uh, the the courage, the bravery, and the power to to walk free in Christ. And Lord, we just pray for them to accept their personal responsibility and their walk uh, with you, and to allow you to work in their lives too. And uh, we pray for everyone to take this message of freedom. Um, to live it and to share it with those around you. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.